Hi, I'm Patty Hickson, the Emily Hall Tremaine Curator of Contemporary Art at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And I'm here at the Wadsworth Athenaeum to tell you a little bit about Protest and Promise selections from the Contemporary Art Collection 1963 to 2019. This is a special exhibition that will be on view through February and museum hours at the Wadsworth Athenaeum are Saturday and Sunday from 12 to 5 and Fridays uh, extended hours from 12 to 8 p.m. So uh, Protest and Promise was born during lockdown when uh, some special exhibitions had to shift on the calendar. And so the contemporary art collection galleries were going to be displaced to make, um, to make room for a special exhibition. Um, I looked at this with um, opportunity. So instead of just moving the current installation to another gallery as is, um, under the present condition with the contentious presidential election, the worldwide pandemic and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement following the murder of George Floyd, um, with this move of the collection, it seemed to be the right moment to shine a light on political art in the collection, specifically work from the civil rights era, which we're back in the midst of, uh, up to the present. Uh, all of these works remain relevant um, to today's political climate. Um, I decided not to focus primarily, focus solely on critical activist work, but also uplifting and empowering work because having hope during these uncertain times seems so important. Okay, next slide. So um, Zoe Leonard's I Want a President was an inspiration for this show. It's a 2018 print edition of 100 prints uh, based on a 1992 original work that is still in the artist's collection. Um, the print uh, is a recent acquisition to the Wadsworth collection. This humble work typed on onion skin paper, or I should say printed on onion skin paper uh, for the edition, calls for a president who's actually experienced some real life hardships. Leonard's manifesto calls for a dyke for president, a black woman, someone with AIDS for president, someone who's been incarcerated, had cancer, experienced domestic violence, someone who has no health insurance, et cetera. Uh, in this presidential election year, um, so many of the issues and shortcomings of today are outlined in this work from 28 years ago, which I believe is why the artist uh, released it as an edition recently. Uh, the original work was made in 1992 at the height of the AIDS crisis, when uh, lesbian poet Eileen Miles made a bid for the presidency as a quote, openly female, end quote, independent candidate in a field of three white men, Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush, and Ross Perot. Uh, next slide. The earliest work in the show is Robert Rauschenberg's retroactive one from 1963. The work depicts John F. Kennedy, among other screen printed collage imagery, including an astronaut of course, JFK was in support of the, of the space program, famously stating, we choose the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Uh, Kennedy's presidency was called Camelot for the spirit of hope the young president brought to the office and to the country, uh, a feeling echoed in the election of Barack Obama in 2008. This work and a series of seven other paintings depicting JFK were famously conceived before the president's assassination by Rauschenberg. Um, uh, the, Rauschenberg thought about not making them at all after the assassination because the president's portrait would take on a different meaning, meaning more like uh, a memorial, but Rauschenberg uh, made them anyway. And um, with Kennedy's figure in blue in the work, it does communicate this sense of sadness of the nation in shock after his murder. Uh, next slide. So Katie Nolan's Blue Vault depicts accused Kennedy assassin Lee Harvey Oswald at the moment that he is shot by vigilante Jack Ruby two days after the assassination of JFK. 
Um, Katie Noland is interested in how the news media exploits pain, violence, and shame through imagery. So Nolan took the famous news photograph and Oswald's uh, murder was televised live and isolated the figure of Oswald. Uh, the photographic image was screened onto an aluminum sheet in red ink. Holes were cut in the metal to simulate bullet holes. And finally, the artist wadded up an American flag to um, simulate a gag that's placed in the mouth uh, hole of Oswald. The Kennedy assassination and Oswald's murder have long been the subject of conspiracy theories symbolized by uh, the permanent gagging and silencing of Oswald by death, here illustrated by that American flag. Next slide. Uh, this is Emily May Smith's Medusa from 2019, and this is the most recent work in the show. Um, based on a painting, uh, Emily May Smith made a print in 2019. Um, the artist's avatar that appears throughout her work is the broomstick, based on the animated brooms from The Sorcerer's Apprentice in the Disney film Fantasia. The broomstick figure can represent many things for the artist. Um, the artist's paintbrush, a phallic symbol, or a domestic tool once associated with women's work. Here, the top of the broomstick becomes a head on which snakes become the hair of Medusa. The figure, of course, is a reference to Medusa, the, the mythological female figure who was punished and cursed to turn people to stone if they gazed upon her beautiful face. But in Emily May Smith's hands, Medusa becomes a symbol of female empowerment. Next slide. Uh, this is Kiki Smith's Daisy Chain from 1992. Daisy Chain, the title of this work, refers to a garland of daisies tied together with their stems. Um, the daisy chain is associated with female youth and innocence. Smith's daisy chain is something else. A heap of 100 feet of chain uh, has two arms, two legs, and a severed head attached like a charm bracelet. But the chain pile can also be seen as a body or viscera. By presenting a fragmented female body, Kiki Smith addresses issues of rape, murder, and domestic violence against women. Next image is Sam Durant's Like Man, I'm Tired of Waiting. Durant's series of electric signs borrow the language and form of handmade signs from the civil rights movement in the 1960s. So here we have a large light box on the left and the source image from the civil rights era photograph from the March on Washington on the right. Durant takes the handmade sign, isolates it, enlarges it, and has it fabricated into a lighted sign. When the work is shown in a gallery without the context of the civil rights era photograph, the meaning of the text is completely up to interpretation. For example, um, the, Wadsworth was hung, the Wadsworth hung the sign outside in front of the museum. At the time, there was a bus stop in front of the museum, so it seemed to speak to the people who were waiting for the bus to arrive. Another time, uh, more recently, we hung it in the gallery opposite the elevator, and it seemed to speak to our issue of having a very slow elevator. So um, the work is really about the understanding of language and how it's affected by context and personal experience. Next slide. Uh, this very dark slide, apologies, um, really illustrates um, uh, it shows a series of drawings that, um, that Durant made related to the civil rights photographs, all from the 1960s. And among them is uh, Like Man, I'm Tired of Waiting, the um, second work from the right. Um, so the photographs document events in the moment, uh, and yet the act of drawing is very slow and meditative. So the drawings also honor the handmade quality of the civil rights era signs that are depicted in them. These are hung in the gallery in, in this formation to suggest a rally where you would see 
a sea of signs popping up irregular, irregularly um, above a crowd. Next slide. Oh, and here we just have a context slide to show you the installation um, in the gallery. So in the background, you can see how the uh, drawings are hung in relation to the um, Sam Durant sign piece. And you can also see the Kiki Smith daisy chain on, on the floor uh, in front of the drawings. Uh, next slide. So the second gallery features works uh, primarily related to civil rights, uh, immigration rights, and gay rights. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is Winfred Rembert's uh, chain gang picking cotton. Uh, Rembert's an artist who grew up in rural Georgia, uh, rural Georgia, and as a child, at the age of six, he started working uh, picking cotton. But as a young man, he became interested in the civil rights movement and was arrested after a sit-in became violent. It was in prison that he learned the craft of carving and tooling leather, uh, which is then painted or dyed, which is the medium of this work. At the age of 52, Rembert became an artist. Um, he was encouraged to use this medium to tell this, the personal stories of his life, including working on a prison chain gang to pick cotton. Uh, this work highlights his unique style, I think. Uh, the work is as much abstract as it is figurative. It's rhythmic and repetitive in pattern as the, prison, as the prisoners in black and white striped uniforms wind through the green fields and dotted rows of cotton with gray bags hanging over their shoulders. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have Glenn Ligon's Runaways, a series of 10 prints. Glenn Ligon studied 19th century advertisements written by slave owners to, re, to recapture runaway enslaved people. Ligon was struck, was struck by the detailed and often personal descriptions of runaways that spoke to the complicated relationships between, quote, master and slave, end quote. These are Ligon's words. First project, Ligon asked 10 friends to describe him as if for a missing persons report. Similar to the 19th century ads, the descriptions on the, on the prints combine factual information as well as intimate features about the artist. So in a contemporary context, uh, the texts of the runaways also relate to police and FBI wanted posters, making that connection between slavery and mass incarceration of the black community. This also relates to uh, Winfred Rembert's work. Next slide. Um, Judy Baca's Pancho de la Terra, Dirty Mexican, um, is a translation of Pancho de la, de la Terra. Judy Baca is best known as the mural artist who spearheaded the Great Wall of Los Angeles, a half mile long community created mural in downtown LA that depicts the often overlooked history of women BIPOC and LGBTQ people of the LA area. And it was made in um, the late 1970s. Um, her work was to represent the diverse heritage of Los Angeles that was lacking visibility. Here in this sculpture of the stereotypical poncho figure, crouching with a sombrero and striped blanket, serves as a miniature mural with imagery across his body. Bisecting the figure is a chain link fence with razor wire on top. It speaks about immigration and border issues between the US and Mexico. And although this work was made in 95, 1995, now 25 years later, we're still wrestling with these border and immigration issues. Next slide, please. Um, this is a recent acquisition to the collection. This is Mel Melvin Edwards, Two is One. Um, it is part of his Lynch Fragment series. Here we have two fragments that are connected by a chain. Edwards began making the Lynch Fragments in 1963 at the height of the Civil Rights Movement and um, the year of the, the March on Washington and also the year of JFK's assassination. The fragments are welded together from tools, scraps of metal, 
um, strap, uh, scraps of steel, objects like spikes, hooks, and hinges. Together, they approximate the size of a head and are hung at the artist's height of six feet on the wall. They can be seen as um, self-portraits, essentially. Um, the material of chain is a signature material for Edwards. It speaks to the legacy of violence and oppression, of course, but as much as the chain connotes ideas of slavery and incarceration, the work can also, um, the chain can also hold positive associations such as kinship, which links people together. Next slide, please. And finally, this is Felix Gonzalez Torres's Untitled Perfect Lovers from 1989-1990. Uh, here, Felix Gonzalez Torres uses two ordinary office clocks to talk about relationships. This untitled work bears the subtitle Perfect Lovers. When the work is hung in the gallery, the clocks have new batteries, they're synchronized to the same time, and they just kiss each other on the wall. So they start out as a perfect pair, a perfect couple. Initially, the clocks are in sync until inevitably one set of batteries starts to run down and then the clocks are out of sync, which can be likened to a relationship when you don't see eye to eye or aren't getting along. Ultimately, one set of batteries dies before the other. Uh, the sculpture represents the universal fear of losing a loved one and being left behind. The work is also a quiet commentary on the AIDS epidemic. Gonzalez Torres's partner, Ross Laycock, died of the disease in 1991, just a year or so after this work was created. The artist Felix Gonzalez Torres died from AIDS in 1996. And the final slide. Um, thank you for joining me on this abbreviated tour of Protest and Promise, and we look forward to seeing you at the Wadsworth very soon.